All right, uh, Damon, uh, if you want to start recording, I'm going to get started. Okay. Hello, uh, my name is Clifford Eberly, and I'm the Exhibitions Associate for Hicks Art Center Gallery here at Bucks. Uh, welcome to the Artist Talk with Helen Rebecca Garber, whose painting installation, Winter Codex, is currently on view in the Hicks Art Center Gallery group exhibition, code number safe, unsafe. I invite you all to visit the gallery after this talk to see the exhibition for yourself, uh, meet some of the artists who will be here and enjoy the light refreshments. To give you a little background, um, code number safe, unsafe is an extension of code word safe, the exhibition I curated and produced at the Fellows of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles in 2019. Code Word Safe included artworks and performances that demonstrated the delicate balance between artists' intentions and messaging through texts and language manifested in, for example, sculptural letters that formulated a fence of protection from intrusion to painted images symbolizing texts from an inventive, invented tarot-inspired deck of cards. For code number safe, unsafe, the artworks expose the implied, calculated, logical, chance, and disappearing numeric systems we navigate and explore every day, made visible through maps, natural selection, evolving computer software, and more. Helen's Winter Codex paintings were born from her quotidian and occupational experiences, the painted marks functioning as literal but mysterious codes for us to decipher from their dense, rich surfaces. Before Helen describes her paths to creativity, I would like to tell you about her background. Uh, Helen Rebecca Garber was born in State College in 1976. Her artworks examine the aesthetic variations between numerical patterns and codexes, as well as the pressures and paradoxes of caregiving in the current technological age. She grew up in New York City and spent two decades as a working artist in Los Angeles. Her work has been exhibited both nationally and internationally and reviewed in publications such as the New York Times and the Los Angeles Times, among others. She studied painting at the Long Island School of the Arts, the Arts Students League of New York, and the New York Academy of Art. After moving to Los Angeles, she earned a Bachelor of Fine Arts from the California Institute of the Arts. While continuing to pursue a career as a professional artist, Helen returned to school to study nursing after volunteering as an inpatient art instructor at Children's Hospital Los Angeles. She earned an associate degree in nursing, a bachelor's in the science of nursing, a master's in nursing education, and eventually earned a postmaster's family nurse practitioner degree from the University of South Alabama School of Nursing. Before pursuing a career as a nurse practitioner, she worked as a neonatal intensive care RN in level three NICUs across Southern California. She has also worked as a clinical nursing instructor at both Keck and LAC USC Medical Centers. She splits her time between her practice as a professional artist and her practice as a family nurse practitioner and lives in Kingston, New York. I encourage you to read Helen's artist statement located in the binder outside the gallery over at Hicks Art Center. And now it is my pleasure and great honor to introduce Helen Rebecca Garber. I'm a little short here. Okay. <laughs> um, hello, my name is Helen Rebecca Garber, and um, that was a great inter introduction. Thank you, Cliff. I do um, bifurcate my time between uh, working in medicine and working as a professional artist. Um, today, I would like to talk a bit about the art process um, and how um, how 
it morphs into new things and how it's connected to your life, your daily life, um, your experiences, and how bringing those things into your life actually creates new, um, it creates new ideas and it kind of moves your work forward. Um, so I wanted to start with uh, a very, um, what would be a kind of an obscure painting. Um, next slide. Okay, this painting. This was a one-off painting I made in 2015. I was working on a show. Um, I was doing completely different work. Um, something in my uh, routine, I was doing a lot of um, working in the hospital, working with the EHR, which um, for my nursing students, you will become very familiar with and uh, both, no, you won't love it. You'll hate it. You'll hate every moment of it. <laughs> um, and a lot of my time was spent working with numbers, working with lab values, working with uh, measurements. Um, and I was starting to realize that these numbers were creating stories and really important stories. And they kind of became codes. And in every different, um, and in different, every different profession, we have these codes that only people that are in those professions can interpret. So um, I made this one-off painting and it was involving, um, it was um, kind of based on my EHR, my electronic health records. Um, I put this painting aside and I continued doing the, um, the work I was doing, which at the time was based more in spirituality. Um, here is an example of that work. Um, these were my uh, pieces, as you can see, they're from 10 years ago. Um, I started making these pieces. Um, originally, I was a figurative painter. And when I went back to school, when I went to CalArts, um, I kind of had to um, deconstruct everything down to the point of the gesture. And then um, I spent a good five years building that up again. And I found that the works almost became figurative, but in a more abstract way. And I found I was depicting um, spiritual energy, which was kind of a portrait unto itself. So um, I was making these pieces. Um, next slide. Here's another example. Um, I've always worked in oils. Um, these pieces are very textural. If anybody sees my work that's on exhibit, you'll see. Um, for me, it's not just about the image. It's about building it up in a three-dimensional way, um, almost the way um, the uh, it, it, they almost become like living beings. There's so many layers under the pieces. Um, it's almost like uh, when I was uh, studying as a figurative art, we would learn the ecroche. And this is another place where medicine and art intersect. Um, you would, um, for artists or nursing students who are not familiar with an ecroche, what you would do is, this was a classical um, technique that they would use in the 19th century to learn the human body. You would begin by sculpting the entire skeleton then you would put in the internal organs and then you'd put in um and then you would um you would you would sculpt each internal organ and you would place it inside the skeleton and then you would um start working with the muscles you would sculpt each individual muscle and you would then apply that on top and then you would eventually at the at the end you would put the skin on and so it ends up looking like a regular sculpture, but actually if you cut into that sculpture, it would be like dissecting a body, albeit made of clay. Um, and I've taken those ideas in when I build the layers within my painting. Um, you can go to the next slide. So as you can see, these paintings, um, we're really about depicting energy. 
Um, it was kind of my transition from figuration into painting something that was more, um, that was less um, kind of, uh, that was less, um, I guess I would say hyper-realistic, something that dealt more with ideas than that dealt with um, surface depiction. So these pieces were almost like the portraits I made, but um, they were more about the energy. Um, and I wanted to kind of figure out a way of painting something that didn't exist, but was also something that would feel like it, um, that people could connect with. Um, you can go to the next slide. Um, so as I was painting those pieces, I, began, um, as I was working with the layers, I began layering more and more and more to the point where these pieces actually started becoming um, completely white, completely monotone. Underneath these pieces, they looked like the previous pieces. Um, when you see these pieces in person, you can see the um, underlying colors and it makes the paintings actually um, vibrate. Uh, it's very hard to actually, um, it's very hard to document these pieces using a camera or um, on the computer because um, they're more like living beings. They, uh, when you see them in person, like um, they have such, a, they're so sculptural and so textural that it's less, it's not only about it being a painting, it's also about it being an object. So um, I was painting, I was doing these white pieces for several years. Um, and as you can see, they're still kind of based in an, the idea of depicting energy, like an energy force. Um, you can go to the next slide. Um, I spent a lot of time in Europe as well. Um, and these pieces, um, I started making these pieces into spiritual objects. So I did an entire series of cathedrals, and these were kind. Of, these were based on taking the energy and turning them into, and kind of meshing it with cathedral architecture, as kind of like they were like spiritual bodies. So, um, so as you can see, they continued to um, evolve. Um, you don't see any numerical context in here yet because. I was still keeping that in the back of my mind. And I still felt like I didn't have the permission because I wasn't really, um, I didn't really know what it meant, but it kept coming up and I kept making secret work. Um, so I was showing these pieces. Um, I showed them many places. I showed them um, both here. I had a show in Mexico City. I showed in San Francisco. Um, and all this time, I was actually, um, I was working, I, actually, at this point, I had graduated from nursing school. I actually went to nursing school in secret because um, I had a career as a professional artist, and the idea in the art world of doing something else was not really accepted. Um, I remember I did this show in um, in I I did this show in San Francisco and I got a call from a uh, an art writer and he said we love the show now just don't mess everything up by going to medical school or having a baby <laughs> okay my daughter was born in 2015 um, and. Uh, so I listened to that and I thought about um, the I thought about the things that were accepted in the art world and the things that were not accepted in the art world. And um, as a professional artist, I was supposed to be completely career oriented. I was not supposed to have children. I was never supposed to talk about my family um, and or any outside interests. So. Um, I did not come out as um, when I graduated. I graduated in 2015 with my RN. I went back to school later, um, which was very hard um, because I do feel like the later you go back to school, the harder it is. Um, but I went through the whole thing and uh, my 
um, somebody congratulated me on all my hard work and passing the NCLEX on Facebook. And all of a sudden, all my all of my uh, dealers contacted me and were like, what is this about? Um, and I lost a lot of friends, I will tell you, um, because a lot of people didn't think that I was taking my work seriously. Um, you can go to the next slide. Um, so um, I decided that I was not going to let anybody else dictate my life, um, what I did in my life. And I felt like um, as a woman, as an artist, um, I'm going to uh, chart my own path. And so I continued painting. I found other dealers and I was very vocal about the fact that I was very proud to be a nurse. I've learned so much being a nurse. I've learned so much humility. I feel like I've learned so much being outside of the art world from my patients, from my other, from my colleagues. Um, it's brought a richness to my life that I didn't have in the art world uh, because now I was dealing with life and death. I was really, I was getting to know people. I was, I was a party to their most intimate moments and oftentimes helping strangers through the worst days of their lives. Um, and I felt doing both, which was difficult and challenging and still is to this day, um, really gave me a very good balance. Um, and being a nurse and doing what I was doing in the hospital started creeping into the work. These pieces, um, you can, it, there is a bit of a figurative element going on in these pieces. Um, I started using the, um, uh, I come from a family of Orthodox Yemenite Jews, and I have seven uncles that were jewelers. And I started using the, um, the heirlooms that I had received from my mother. And I started using the designs in them and putting them into the paintings. So these have a bit of a Yemenite feel to them. You can see also there, um, I'm starting to bring in the idea of the woman into the paintings. Um, you can go to the next one. Here we go, here's some codexes. So um, as I was saying, my, my work as a nurse started creeping into my work as an artist. Um, I was really using left brain and right brain. And those, um, and I started building these codexes based on um, as as I was constantly interpreting labs, coming up with you know calculations. Because also, let's remember, I worked in the NICU. It's all calculations, um, I, and these calculations basically dictate the care. Uh, and you can't get them wrong, especially when your patient weighs eight hundred grams. So. Um, but, and I started noticing these patterns within the, cal cal within the calculations as I started taking care of more and more patients that were going through similar issues. So I actually started using this and building codexes in my work. Um, these pieces um, are the beginning of, um, I would build my own alphabets. Basically, I would come up with um, something that I wanted to say and I would take an alpha, take the alphabet, and I would um, build codes. I would use different. Um, I would use like I would come up with different alphabets, come up with uh, different symbols for each different letter, and then I would build these kind of codes into the work. So this is one of the first pieces where I actually started doing that. You can see that it kind of, if you really look at it, it. it does appear to be an alphabet. You can see some of the uh, symbols repeating themselves. And I kind of build this into a little puzzle for the viewer. Um, you can go to the next. Okay, here is more of that. And this in this piece, I was morphing the two. I was morphing the spiritual um, and I was morphing the codes. Um, this is actually a code that is based on a piece in the New Yorker about um, caregiving. And you can also see I used um, a Mayan calendar and the blue um, dots down below are based on a waltz. Um, I, 
I'm very interested in finding patterns and things. Um, I just feel like that's uh, kind of the underlying river of spirituality are in these patterns. You can go to the next slide. Here we go. So here's where I start bringing it all together. Um, if, if there are any nurses in the audience, you're going to understand some of these codes that are in here. Um, you'll see that I use the fishtail up there um, with, uh, and here I'm building basically another, it's um, a, an image of spiritual energy, but I also started using some of my nursing notes um, of um, nothing. They're all HIPAA. They're, I didn't violate HIPAA, but um, I'm using um, patients um, that stuck with me. Sometimes you'll have, um, you'll become very connected to a patient, especially like for me when I was in the NICU, sometimes I would end up taking care of the same patient for months. And I would take this small, basically fetus, um, because they're really not babies yet. And I would have, I felt like we were growing people. We would, um, that we would take them from the birth, which was always unexpected um, to and nurture these small beings, teach them how to eat, um, wait for them to open their eyes, you know, um, for, for sometimes we had babies for like seven months. Um, they couldn't go home because they couldn't, um, because they still need, they needed to be with us. And I take them all the way to the point where they could actually be discharged with their families and just be normal babies. And I would also go through this with their parents, go through this. It's never a good experience for anyone. It's always unexpected. Um, having to be in the hospital for months at the time, wondering if your child's going to survive, things like that. Um, and luckily, um, I'm knock on wood, I just happened to, I never lost a baby, which, but every day, every day I went in there, I always thought, is this going to be the day? Is this going to be the day where I'm going to lose somebody's child? And um, so every single one of those patients stays with you. So I started using things like my notes and vital signs and things like that in the work because it was a way of me um, kind of memorializing my experience with them because it stays with you and it, it really, a part of that never leaves. Okay, you can go to the next slide. Next slide, thank you, okay. So these are some works on paper. A lot of times I will, um, like making a large piece, because these pieces are large. These pieces are like seven by eight feet, um, six by five feet. They're large. And um, oftentimes they'll take me about three months to make. Um, so oftentimes I like to work out my ideas um, on paper and because it's less of an investment, you can go through ideas faster. Although I always say that I never bake a bad painting because I, I can always paint over it because my work is so thick. Um, you can go to the next slide. Okay, here's more of the codexes. Um, these were um, these were random alphabets. Actually, I was making these kind of based on automatic writing, which was um, I, um, there was a huge uh, spiritual mo movement in this country in the late 19th century, um, and automatic writing was a big part of it. Where you would have uh, mediums that they would hold seances, and the medium would probably um, most of them were probably tricksters, but what they would do is um, they would take the spirit into them and they would write. Supposedly the spirit would use their body to write these um, and they would come up with um, automatic writing. And so I thought that was a really interesting idea for making an image. So I began making these pieces. Um, once again, you know, nothing's ever random. You will also, the more you make them, the more you see the patterns in them. I find that really interesting. 
Um, you can go to the next slide. Um, here are some pieces, as I said, I always like to kind of, um, I like to kind of leave puzzles for the viewer. So these pieces are also based on um, how I would make them is I would take an alphabet and I would um, I would interpret it into different types, um, different symbols. So these pieces um, are, once again, I believe these pieces were based on Walt Whitman, who was also a nurse in the, um, during the Civil War. Um, and these were based on Walt Whitman's poetry. And what I would do is I would make, um, I would, I would interpret, um, I would, um, take a particular passage that I found very um, captivating and I would um, I would translate that passage into symbols. And then what I would do to add a further layer is I would actually, um, I would hide half of the symbol. And so these are, and all of these pieces can actually be, in, it can actually be interpreted, like they can be decoded. Um, it's kind of a fun, playful way of making work for me. Um, you can go to the next slide. Uh, here is another um, another example of that. Um, I was making these pieces in Los Angeles as well. Um, and actually, I have not shown these pieces, but these were more of my kind of secret works that um, I wasn't showing. It, these, and I just kept making these over the years, um, not really knowing where they were leading. Um, sometimes it's not the right time to make that work, but you should make it anyway. Sometimes, and I do feel like those moments of play where you're like, oh, what am I doing? This is completely different than the work that I'm making. Those ideas of play are really important because they are pulling you in a direction that is important to only you. Maybe there's no reason for you to be making these works. Like, I mean, I went through a really rigorous art program. Uh, Cal Arts is well known for being very theoretical. You're constantly defending your work. Um, and that was a good thing for me. But when I got out, it also kind of felt burnt. I felt a bit burned out. And it was kind of hard to find myself again. So um, give yourself permission to make work that other people won't like, other people won't understand. Um, if you keep coming back to making that kind of work, then it means something. You can go to the next slide. These are more of my insignificant, significant works, I call them. So these are the pieces on uh, paper that I started making. You can see the alphabets underneath. And these were all based on magical languages. Um, magical, um, magical alphabets were used in, uh, the, in the Middle Ages to code, um, to code books. Um, so there were certain ideas that were thought to be, um, that, need, uh, that were needed to be secreted. And so, um, so, so the, so they would come up with these mystical alphabets and they would use them to code books for, um, it would, and I found that to be a really interesting idea, like who, um, you're, you're basically, you're, um, this is important information, but the only people that are really, um, but it's only supposed to be for the initiated. So this is information that isn't for everyone. This is information that is only for a certain group of people. And um, I also find we have that kind of in medicine. Um, it's uh, like, um, I'm very close with my sister. She's an emergency medicine physician. And she once said to me, she was like, we're like, uh, we're like um, in Harry Potter, you know, everyone else is a muggle. We wear we wear weird outfits, scrubs, and we talk in a strange language, and we and we talk, talk about things other people don't uh, um, that are not a part of this group would understand. And um, I think that's true both in medicine and in the art world. 
Um, but I do also feel like I aim to make work that um, is accessible to everyone. My work is not just for um, people in the art world with capital A. I want it to be for everyone. I want everyone to get something out of it. Um, you don't have to understand it. You don't have to um, do anything more than just look at it. And if you like it, you like it. If you don't, you don't. Um, but um, I find that, you know, um, other artists work, I've gone through phases in my life where I didn't understand work, work made by certain artists. I didn't like it. Um, it didn't speak to me. But then maybe 20 years later, I'll find something in that work that I need. And I will go back to a certain artist. Um, and I will go, um, I will kind of really educate myself on their work and go very in depth into it, because it, I need something in that work at the time. And I think that's what it means to be a part of the artist, uh, you know, the world artist community. You go to different artists at different times to get what you need. And then, you know, hope, and then you take it and you make it your own. Um, okay. You can go to the next slide. Here's more of my magical alphabets. You can see they're very involved. Um, and also I have another thing to say about making art. Um, you can make art anywhere with anything at any time. Um, I made these works when I lived in my studio in downtown LA. Um, I was actually in nursing school at the time when I made these works and I made them at night on the bed um, because I didn't have anywhere else to make them. Um, I think it's really important to keep your practice as an artist very plastic, um, very open. Doesn't matter if you're working in a tiny little sketchbook or if you have a warehouse studio, um, you can always make something interesting. I think it's just about continuing to explore it, continuing to make new things and don't ever worry about whether it's good or not because there's no such thing, you know. <laughs> you can go to the next slide. All right, well, that's um, a little bit about me, a little about the, bit about the work I make. Um, and um, if, you, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to take some. Um, those pieces, the works on paper, those pieces are uh, 30 by 40 inches. And um, I, it, when I make those pieces, I actually do a lot of, um, I do a lot of um, dual pieces, like um, where they're mirror images of each other, because um, I'm. I think it's an interesting I, a way of making an image. That's you know, and it's an interesting way of presenting an image. Um, it's certain things work better at certain sizes. Um, and a lot of that's just based on the medium, like um, oils. Um, it's easy to be, to make a piece precious when you're working in oils small. I prefer to work really large, but um, I have also um, had a bunch of different studios and um, I'm always working every night at work. Like um, when I get home from the opening tonight, I will be sitting in front of my easel making work again. But um, I do think it's, for me, I can't, um, it's, it's the medium. Like a pencil is not gonna be the same. It's not going to work the same at a large scale as a, as a brush. But that's just for me. Some people have been able to make incredible pencil pieces that are monstrous. Um, I would, as of right now, though, I need the keys. <laughs> I do have keys for them all. <laughs> uh, the fishtail, um, 
is basically a way of writing down um, of writing down labs. So basically, you um, um, you make um, a line with two V's, and then um, you code your labs um, as far as like um, the um, the values. Like the um, I haven't worked with that in years, but um, you'll have like you know sodium, potassium, I believe it, and um, and that's for adult. I don't really work with that right now, but um, I did then. Um, and so it's kind of like, it's a basic thing. Like when you're a nurse, you have something called a brain, um, which is, you, it's like a sheet and you write down um, your patients, you write down like their vitals, um, any important labs, um, any important times they need medications and you'll have your brain. And usually you, it's just a sheet of paper and you'll um, fold it for as many patients as you have and that'll be your day. And God forbid you lose your brain. That's why we call it the brain because it's all your information. It's a very low key way of doing it, especially in the high tech world of medicine. Everyone does it and it's efficient. So yeah, I would take my brains home and I would work from them. Any other questions? Well, actually, that's a good question. Uh, remember the past three years? <laughs> COVID. Yeah, I actually, um, I did a whole bunch of drawings earlier this year that were based on stress because you're under, um, as a nurse practitioner, I'm under a lot of stress um, over the past three years. And I find that making work for me is a way of decompressing. And it's also a way of like making a diary. Um, and, you know, um, or no, um, my husband's not in medicine, but look, I'm very close with my sister and she is. Um, sometimes when you have a bad outcome or a really bad day, um, it's really important to have somebody that you can decompress with. And I also, um, oftentimes I get home really late at night. Um, I will, I think actually that's where this started because I, it was a way of going over the day and kind of like turning it into something, not just leaving it, you know, not just kind of letting it lay there. It's kind of a way of kind of keeping a diary. Does that make sense? You're welcome. Oh, we, we actually have a question coming in from the Zoom. Oh, okay. uh, they asked if you could explain a little bit about the deciphering the codes and things of that nature that you have in there. Um, about the code? Yes. Oh, um, well, the codes are basically, I mean, I make them up and I keep keys. So it's not like I, um, and usually when I do a new, uh, new body of work, I'll start it by trying different codes. Um, and I'll sit down and I'll use graph paper, paper and I'll write down the alphabet and I will um, start researching. I'll come up with with ideas for this code. You know, um, sometimes I'll like lately. I've been using a lot of other a lot of uh, dead languages. I, I have a big library, and I'll um, and I'll use um, I I'll use codes from like a dead. I'll use like the characters from like a dead language, or sometimes I'll even use it just uh, just use basic shapes, um, colors, things like that. Um, and it's endless. So, and it's kind of a really interesting way of making a new image because it kind of takes you completely out of any um, of, it kind of leaves the idea of the final um, image up to chance. And that way, I think I keep going back to that and going back to the using numbers and things like that because there's a meaning underneath them. And I don't know what the image is going to look like be until I, I put down the code and then I kind of work from that image. It's almost like an abstraction, a way, a way to build an image from there. And then I go into things aesthetically. And then that's the fun part, you know.
Um, well, I would say, I mean, now I find um, it was weird. Okay. So I was working briefly in primary care um, as a nurse practitioner. And I started having people coming to me from the art world because they Googled me and they found me as an artist. <laughs> and I kind of, it kind of, I, I found that a little odd. I, it was a little, a little disconcerting for me because I play, um, because these are two very distinctive roles. Um, I would like to find a place where I can uh, bring them together because I do think in medicine, we don't really um, address the quality of life issues, spiritual issues, and psych. Um, I think living a good life keeps you healthy and to live a good life, um, you need things like community. I think all our happiness comes from our interactions with other people. Um, it, I think um, most unhappiness comes from isolation. And I feel like, um, you know, there've been studies, the happiest people in the world are the people that do things like, you know, volunteer or um, are part of, a, um, or have an active religious life, which I don't, but I completely, um, I completely support. And I think that it's, uh, I've definitely seen people who have um, really been helped by the power of prayer in the hospital. And um, so I do think that there is something to be said for um, creativity leading to um, mental and physical health. And um, I really would like to see more of an incorporation of both. You're welcome. You don't have to do just one thing, you know. Life is uh, big and long and exciting. And I think it's really important to keep gr growing and learning. Any other questions? Okay, thank you everyone for coming.